G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing our off-season series, talking about each team individually, um, where I'm analyzing their best 22, their depth, potential list gaps and stuff like that, as well as having a crack at projecting how 2024 might go with all of that analysis in mind. So I've been doing this in reverse alphabetical order, starting with the Western Bulldogs, and now we are here at the GWS Giants Football Club. As I've said previously, if you want to find that content and uh, try and find me talk about your club, there is a playlist on the channel called uh, Team Based Videos for 2024. Alternatively, it is all in the last bunch of uh, videos I've done on this channel, so you can find it pretty easily. Before I crack into the GWS Giants, if you could do me a favor and consider subscribing to the channel if you're enjoying the content. Uh, obviously, we do AFL for about 10, 10 and a half months a year, um, and I still might do some AFL content over the summer as well. And then, you know, in the summer to fill in the gaps, we're all also going to be covering the Big Bash League and general cricket content. So if that sounds your kind of speed, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Great, let's talk about the GWS Giants. Um, and first of all, I guess we'll contemplate how 2023 went. Um, it was a bit of a surprise year, it has to be said. I was one of those people who didn't expect big things from GWS. You know, they had a bit of a failed season last year. Leon Cameron makes way. Adam Kingsley's first co uh, year as coach at this new club. And, you know, consider the, the off-season losses last year of Taranto and Hopper. There was a big building recipe for another uh, season where the Giants miss fire perhaps and, and make, don't make the finals and you know halfway through the season it looked like it was going to be trending that way uh, after the bye in round 15 they were in 14th position and not really in the finals race it has to be said they were at the bottom four at the end of four different rounds including at the end of t uh, round 12 of this year so to say that we didn't see the second half of the year coming from the Giants uh, would be a bit of an understatement and you know considering it was a new coach I think we we were all fairly relaxed about that in the sense that a new coach needs time for his game plan to gel with uh, the players that he's just received. But they won seven of the last nine games. Uh, they won at, uh, I don't even remember how many venues, but they were very much uh, anywhere, anytime, any opponent kind of team. And uh, the way that they stormed not only into finals, but all the way to a prelim and got one point off a grand final is a huge testament to what Adam Kingsley has already been able to achieve in such a short space of time. And one feature of their style this year uh, in 2023 was very much an attacking brand of football with uh, you know attacking ball use from the half back line, the way they cut teams up, they call it the orange tsunami. And you have to give a lot of credit to uh, to Kingsley for being able to cultivate that. In particular, in the second half of the year, um, one thing that probably got underrated by outsiders, including myself, was just how good their midfield is. And it really hit their straps uh, towards the back end of this year with guys like Tom Green having a career best season. Then you have Canelio, uh, who's kind of flirted with his best form in pr previous years, but it clicked for him. Josh Kelly, Callan Ward, they all started playing it really well. Toby Green obviously had an amazing season. I think it was his best year in terms of goal kicking. He'd, his previous best was 45. He kicked 66 this year, which is just ludicrous. One of the absolute best players in the comp. I think I actually ranked him as the second best player in the comp. And we also saw some uh, close to career best form from Jesse Hogan towards the end of the year, which was a real question mark for them in terms of like finding a long-term or medium-term key forward for them. That was definitely a part of the ground where the list gap was the most obvious, but I think the way their forward line clicked at the back end of the year, there's some upside there with Riccardi. That was a huge plus for them as well, it has to be said. And down back as well, Sam Taylor has announced himself as one of the best absolute best key defenders in the league. But it wasn't just them. I'm skimming off the top here. You know, we had defenders like Buckley, um, Connor Iden as well. And Kieran Briggs also stepped up to be one of the better young, but well, one of the best performed young rucks in the competition. So before I get into analyzing their best 22 or having a crack at it, I should say, and then analyzing it, um, let's talk about the off season. And it was an uncharacteristically quiet off season uh, for GWS because unfortunately what's plagued them over the years has been their retention issues, keeping talented players at their club. But this off season's cuts just included Phil Davis retiring, um, Matthew Flynn joining West Coast, Daniel Lloyd, Jason Gilby, and Cameron Fleeton leaving the club. So just five cuts. In terms of their additions, they obviously drafted Phoenix Goddard. If you followed the draft, that was probably the most talked about draft pick out of them all. James Leake slid to pick 17. They added Joe Fonte from Claremont, and then Harvey Thomas, an academy player. And then they added a Cat B rookie in Nathan Wardier, so I don't know too much about. So I've had a crack here at their best 22. And this, uh, the first thing that sticks out to me is that it's a very settled team, I would argue. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be 
disagreements with particularly their fans, but I, I found there was a there was generally a pretty settled look to this team. And I suppose when you don't have any major outs or um, you know traded in players, that makes sense. As you can see, normally I, I put in yellow the new players to the list, and I don't have any yellow on the screen here. So starting with their back line, you know that that back trio is actually pretty good. Um, Sam Taylor is the headliner in that. Jack Buckley I thought was really good this year. He takes the other key back spot, and then Himmelberg continues his move into the back line. And then when you look at their medium rebounding types, Iden had a great year. Whitfield is obviously a star. Lockie Ash, a former high draft pick that uh, is pretty damn good as well. So again, a very settled back six there. I have uh, moved uh, Isaac coming out and put him on the bench. I could see him potentially playing on a wing this year. Uh, I think that's probably one part of the ground that they could use a little bit of depth. Uh, but in terms of running defenders there, it's um, it's hard to split you know, coming from the others because they're, they're all pretty damn good. It's obviously a strong midfield that I alluded to er earlier. Uh, very star-studded. Um, if anything, it's a little bit... It's kind of headlined by veterans at this point, but you've also got... They're kind of bookended with Tom Green and then also the potential of Finn Callahan, which I think is quite high at AFL level. I've chucked him on a wing for the purposes of this analysis, but I do think a very high potential midfielder and maybe one that could have a breakout year this year. But again, another very settled midfield. Um, we'll get into later a little bit about depth because I do wonder what would happen if some of their depth was exposed in this part of the ground, but the top end quality is quite obvious. In their small to medium forwards, you know, they're, they're, they're very dangerous. They've got one of the best in the game in, in Toby Green. And when I say best in the game, I mean like overall players. Uh, Brent Daniels has also become a very, uh, very good half forward as well for them. They recruited Toby Bedford. He'll be in this team. Um, and then Callum Brown as well, the Irishman, um, I, I think had a pretty damn good year for him. So from the small to medium point of view, pretty settled and dangerous, and they've obviously drafted Goddard as well. The tall forwards are, uh, are far from completely locked in, uh, but Hogan obviously had the good year. Jake Riccardi has shown some upside, some improvement this year, um, and I have picked Cadman as a forward pocket in this particular team. Now, I don't know exactly whether he starts round one, but I think a former number one draft pick gets a crack early. Um, because he does have a pretty good running game. He can push up high and be almost like a high key forward. Uh, I think he played a bit of wing as a junior as well. So potentially he just plays a bit more of a higher role until his body develops enough to be maybe the person who takes over from um, to, uh, Jesse Hogan in that team. But I think he'll start round one, even though I think he kicked six goals from 12 games last year. He's obviously very raw, um, but I think they start the year with him in and then go from there. It's also a very strong bench, like all the players that I've put on the bench there in Ward, Cumming, Brown, and uh, to a lesser extent, O'Halloran, uh, they're all pretty damn good players. So th that's a very strong 22, and uh, it's even stronger than I realized. Like, I know that they made the prelim, but when I, when I mapped out that 22, I was like... There's a couple gaps, but generally the top end quality is good. I have chucked Haynes as a sub because I don't really know about that one, to be honest. I think he ended the year as a sub or once or twice as a sub or, or subbed out and uh, in the final year of his contract. I don't know if he's going to get guaranteed games next year. It could easily be someone else. So let's talk about the players that I did leave out. I do think James Leak will be one option who uh, could potentially play early. I think he's relatively ready-made, although it is competitive for that particular position in this team. So there's no guarantee. Lockie Keefe is probably another key defensive option they would use. Um, the midfield depth is one part of the ground where I think they're a little bit vulnerable when you consider uh, they are potentially going to be deep in September again in 2024. So um, the guys outside the 22, I mean, I'm, I'm probably missing some, but you know, there's Harry Rouston. We saw a little bit of time into Connor Stone potentially as a midfielder, but uh, there's a big gap between what's in the 22 and what's out of it. And since they lost Taranto and Hopper, I think it's, it's not been obvious who that replacement midfielder is. And I do think Rouston has shown some good signs, but um, you know, you, you hope they don't have to rely on him too much in 24. Uh, Govard, I left just out of this team, but just looking at how much they seem to rate him, looking at like their, they did a video on the Giants uh, YouTube channel um, uh, talking him up and saying that their small forwards are going to be a, a focus for them in terms of building an unstoppable trio, I presume. Uh, so he's a chance to play early. I just didn't quite put him in, but he, he could be a sub potentially. So that's their 22. It, it's a very strong top end. Um, maybe he doesn't have... Some clear depth other than some running defensive options, but maybe that's just down to my own ignorance. We'll see. The Giants don't really have too much trouble um, unearthing and developing talent. What I would say their ongoing needs are is for a start, another good year of retention. So this year like was probably, without looking it up, probably their best year ever in terms of not losing players. Now that Taranto and Hopper are gone, I think it's, a, like I just alluded to, a little bit tricky to see what the next evolution of that midfield is once these Cornelios, um, Callan Wards retire. Like who is the next guy in? Considering I've already picked Callahan and Tom Green, who are very, very top-hand potential. 
I still think the aging stars in this team are a little bit of a vulnerability. Whitfield, to some extent, uh, Toby Green, like these guys are not young. They could play deep into their careers. Uh, even Josh Kelly, I think, will be 29 next year. So that's a, that's probably one area that they probably need to focus with their ongoing drafting. Um, there's Green, there's Callahan, and then, you know, in terms of their other mids, there's Rouston, O'Halloran, Stone, Darcy Jones, potentially, who we haven't really seen at all. Um, then there's some speculative types that I just, I'll admit, I don't know much about, like Ryan Angwin. I think he was like a late first round or early second a few years back. Um, there's Harvey Thomas, who they recruited through the academy late this year. Uh, they could unearth someone like that. I could be wrong on that. Uh, we could potentially see Grzuski this year as well. He was a player that I liked in his draft year. Um, it hasn't featured yet. He's a bit more of a tall, undersized, key position defender forward. I actually don't know where they intend to play him. So he's just one player I'll be looking out for. I do think their ruck situation is pretty sweet. Kieran Briggs is a good ruck and you'd think will be a long-term ruck. He really came on this year. And Bruce is a backup. You know, that's, that's pretty damn good. Um, I would just say my only comment here is that the Giants is probably just to have a look at the transition of that midfield in particular. But in terms of 2024, you know, given their late season surge, it's pretty easy to extrapolate that to a top four finish in 2024 as well. I do think that, you know, they've got a great game plan and they've got the players to execute that game plan. There's individual brilliance, there's team brilliance. Uh, there's nothing, there's not really a limit I would I would put on GWS this year. I'm not saying they have the strongest list, but when you get one point off a grand final, nearly beat the Pies at the G, um, even with some deficiencies, like maybe not the, the strongest tall, forwards op, uh, tall forward options, if their best players click again this year, there's no there's no cap. I would just say that their midfield depth might be a bit of a vulnerability if it gets exposed. You know, we're talking multiple injuries here. Touch wood, I don't want that to happen, obviously. But uh, I do think that's one place they could get exposed. But again, if Finn Callahan steps up in the way that I think he could, maybe that, uh, that is mitigated somewhat. I would suggest that they go into this year as outside contenders. They're still... Um, they're not a young team as such, but there is still the element of, uh, of a coach in his second year. That being said, look what Craig McRae just did. So for them, if the second half of 2023 is anything to go by, again, I'm not going to put a, a cap on what this team could achieve this year. The first half of 2023, you know, wasn't great, but you do get the sense that that's behind them because of the way they finished the season. So that is my analysis of the GWS Giants. I think they are a genuine contender with the strength of that 22. I, I've talked about the depth, but you know, a good injury run um, with their game style and the individual stars on that team, uh, they, they could achieve anything in 2024. So let me know in the comments what you agree with and disagree with. As always, I hope you're enjoying the content. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.